Appreciate everybody getting on on a Monday morning. Again, the calendar this month kind of worked out this way where we had a USDA report on Friday and uh, we therefore have the aftermath webinar on Monday morning. So hopefully that works out for everyone. But uh, it's been an eventful month to say the least since the last uh, time we convened. Uh, it, it's for an August, uh, middle of August, or last half August, first half September, it's probably been uh, very, very unique to say the least and uh, in, in a lot of negative ways, uh, in some positive ways as well. And we'll dig into some of that as we get started here uh, and look at the highlights uh, the, of what's happened in the markets uh, and, and, and otherwise. But 2020 continues to, uh, to be a <laughs> it's very strange year, let's just say that. Uh, the USDA report on Friday uh, didn't have a lot of significant surprises, and we'll talk about some of that as we move forward. Uh, but a lot of folks were wondering how USDA would handle all of the crop damage in Iowa and some other places over the last 30 days. They did put this special note out with the report on Friday, which uh, basically said that the conditions for the report were taken as of September 1. So any freeze damage in the upper Midwest, any storm damage that happened after September 1st uh, would not be included in this report. Those will be included in next month's survey. Uh, they also stated that the duration in Iowa, uh, that uh, they had at least done surveys as of uh, August 10th, uh, or based on the, the storm and and that showed about 550,000 acres less corn anticipated to be harvested of course those numbers can change and they will continue to survey uh for the october crop report as well so just keep that in mind if you saw the report you didn't like what was said if you think it's out of line keep in mind that those numbers are going to be changing here as we go forward in future reports but uh they also did issue this map with their uh uh, maps that they put out, and I thought this was very interesting to give some of us that don't live in central Iowa at least a taste of where things uh, occurred. Uh, I did get to travel up through northeast Iowa last week and did see quite a few fields where we had seen some swirling winds and uh, some of that corn that might be very, very difficult to pick up, but I, I thought this was an interesting map and wanted to share it for those of us that, that aren't in that area uh, to see which areas saw the extreme winds and, and the dark circle being 100 mile an hour plus winds. And uh, I'll talk about this after a while when we look at uh, one of the crop insurance policies, margin protection uh, for 2020. But uh, if you had margin protection insurance in some of these areas uh, where you've seen some heavy wind damage, uh, it could uh, we could be looking at some significant claims being paid this year. Uh, drought continues as well. Not only has Iowa had to fight the winds, but we fought a dry finish to the growing season. You can see the drought monitor as of September 1st continues to show extreme drought in west central Iowa. Uh, we see severe drought, moderate drought as well, extending across the uh, central parts of the Corn Belt. So uh, certainly that has done something to take the top off of some of the crops as well. As far as the report went, uh, I, I stated this on Friday in my podcast. I I cannot remember a report this time of the year where USDA hit the nail on the head or or the trade expectations hit the nail right on the head of what USDA was going to come out with. Uh, it almost felt like USDA used the trade numbers, but when you look at their corn yield at 178 and a half. That was almost right on the trade average guess. Uh, production was just in line as well with uh, just virtually identical to what the trade was expecting to see. Soybean yield, just a tenth of a bushel off. Production, only 18 million bushels off. So it's scary how tight the trade estimates ahead of the report were to what USDA really came out with on the production side. As far as ending stocks, not a whole lot of surprises there either. USDA did make a few tweaks to the old crop, but looking at the new crop, corn stocks virtually, you know, only 50 million bushels apart, soybean stocks only 5 million, and wheat was virtually identical. So it, again, it was awfully scary how close these numbers were uh, to what the trade was looking for. South American production, uh, we're starting that period again, looking ahead to next year, and they're getting ready to start planting in uh, Brazil. And you can see that the forecast for the 
uh, the new crop down there are for records. Uh, once again, we are expecting a 3% increase in soybean acres in Brazil. And so we would expect to see production come up a little bit. So we'll see. Got a long way to go yet, but the, the beans are still in the bag or the corn too, but uh, nonetheless expecting some big crops in the year ahead. One other thing that USDA did issue, or not at USDA, uh, FSA issued on Friday uh, was an update to their uh, submissions from producers and their estimate on a of acres based on what producers have been certifying. And uh, the trade, if you go back to the end of June and then the July crop report, a lot of us were awfully confused at the lack of acres. We had lost some acres somewhere. Uh, based on the FSA certification numbers, then uh, after the July 15th supposed deadline, normal deadline, we were still missing about 5 million acres. Uh, yesterday, USDA, or uh, Friday, uh, FSA kind of made up that 5 million acres, and those were included in this prevent plant acreage on the right-hand side. Ten, Just a little over 10 million acres of prevented plant this past year. About 6.1, uh, I think, of that was corn. And so now our numbers kind of match up. When you look at versus last year and versus the last three years, uh, you can see that the bars are pretty similar. So we didn't really lose acres that we were afraid of. But if you look, uh, you know, go back 30 days ago, we were down by 5 million acres and the numbers just did not add up. So I don't think this has any impact on the markets. I, I think it just makes people now realize that, hey, at least, uh, the government is, uh, you know, didn't miss the acres, didn't lose the acres. The acres were there. Uh, they just fell into a different category this year. So I think that's kind of interesting. You know, last year was a record prevent plant year, almost 20 million acres. This year, you know, historically still one of the biggest years of prevented plant we've had in, in a long, long time. So uh, we, we always anticipate we're going to get most of those acres planted. Pretty common over the last few years have been in the two to four million range. And so we'll see what happens next year. So since last month when we had this, uh, this meeting, uh, it's been a big month in the markets. Corn up 41 cents. Soybeans have gained $1.13. Uh, the wheat market's 20 to 42 cents higher. Cotton's up two and a half cents. Rice up as well. So it's been a good month for the commodity markets. And very, very atypical. We just typically do not see this type of market this time of year. Normally, the, uh, the month of August and September, the markets are, are trading lower. Normally, we're pushing down into new contract lows as we get into harvest. That's not been the case this year. And we'll talk about a few reasons why, but not just on the supply side, but the demand side as well. So it's, we've had a few different black swan events that have kind of propped the markets up. And what have the funds done? Uh, this is, shows a picture of what they've done in their combined grain and oil seed positions. If you recall, a couple of months ago during this webinar, we were looking at big short positions. And in fact, as of uh, the middle of June, into June, they were holding the biggest combined short position that they ever have uh, as of this date or as of that date. But look what's happened over the last 30 days. They've gone on a big buying run. That's why the markets have gone up. And they've reversed that position. They've gone from a combined 200,000 contracts short to now over 300,000 contracts long. And it's not the longest they've ever been, but in the last, uh, what, since 2012 it is. And so pretty, pretty interesting to see that type of a trade in a t time of the year where we normally are putting in our harvest lows. And as far as what the markets have done this year, uh, this chart has changed a little bit over the last uh, month or so. You can see that uh, corn is down 7% still year to date, but it's come back from where it had been. Soybeans uh, are actually just about, well, virtually unchanged. Now this is as of September 1, we're probably now ahead in the soybean market. Corn's probably back closer to zero. Livestock markets have come back up a little bit as well. So uh, things have kind of balanced out a little bit better uh, than where they were just a few months back. So let's start out looking at the soybean market. Soybeans have kind of been the star this year so far, and and a lot of you know a lot of our focus has been on supply last week. But the demand side of the equation has really been the the driver, I believe, in in getting this thing fired back up. Uh, the fact that China has started to meet its obligations under its Phase One trade deal uh, agreement, and you can see that Chinese bean imports have continued, have soared really since uh, back at about the beginning of May. And we've actually now topped uh, where they uh, or had the biggest 
soybean import uh, numbers that we have ever had as of this time of the year. So they have started to pick back up and feeding their livestock, uh, feeding poultry, and uh, consequently it's been a, a benefit to the Brazilian farmers and it's been a benefit to U.S. farmers as well. And thought this was kind of a neat chart that uh, Reuters shared the other day. Uh, as far as weekly sales, we were over 3 million uh, metric tons last week. Uh, one of the biggest weekly sales numbers we've ever seen. The only two times we've ever seen bean sales bigger were, I think, when we had some weeks that were lumped together back uh, around a government shutdown in 2019 and then the other one in 2013. So these were pure sales last week and, again, very surprising for this time of the year. The flip side of that, we've had demand go up. We've had supply dropping back a little bit. When you look at the soybean ratings over the last uh, 30 days or so, you know, we were looking at 74% of the crop rated good to excellent about this time a month ago. And now here we are only at 65% rated good to excellent as of last Monday. Uh, today uh, at 3 p.m., we will get the updated crop condition numbers. I don't anticipate they're going to change a whole lot, maybe drop a point or so. But uh, that has certainly been a big reason we've taken the bloom off of this bean market. And when you look at USDA's numbers from Friday's report on production, uh, you can see where the cuts were made. And these uh, state numbers, uh, all the red states dropped back a little bit from last month. Uh, you can see Iowa was, well, I guess uh, Alabama had the biggest drop at 7.3%, uh, but Iowa was down 6.9%, Michigan down 59 South Carolina big drop, but generally throughout the Midwest, most states did fall back a little bit this past uh, month. Uh, Minnesota still forecasted at a record yield at 52 bushels. Missouri at a record at 51. Indiana and Ohio and Kentucky and Tennessee all forecasting and Pennsylvania all forecasting record yields. That's what the pound sign is for. Uh, U.S. yield at 51.9 would still be a record yield, uh, even though that's down 2.6% uh, from last month. So the balance sheet, uh, USDA did make some adjustments to the old crop balance sheet. They did raise the crush a little bit. They raised exports slightly. End of the year, uh, they are saying with 575 million bushels, that would be as of August 31st, that would be the end of our marketing year. Uh, average farm price at $8.55, that was left unchanged. And we'll talk about this later with PLC and ARC, but this would be the number that would be used to determine final payments for, for the 2019 crop year. Going ahead to this coming year, uh, as expected, USDA did make some changes. They lowered the yield, they lowered production, they lowered the beginning stocks that we just talked about. So supply of beans at 4.903 billion bushels of soybeans. Uh, they did leave demand numbers unchanged. So at the end of the year, they're forecasting we're gonna have stocks down to 460 million bushels. That was down from 610 last month. So a significant drop percentage-wise, about a 25% drop uh, in ending stocks. And even though that is an adequate number, uh, historically, it, it's the trend has been sharply lower. And this kind of takes stocks to back, back to where we were three years ago in the 2017, 2018 year. And if you look at the average farm price, USDA forecasting nine and a quarter, that year we were at 933. And stocks to use ratio, pretty similar, just over 10%. So this really lines up price-wise with where, the, where we were three years ago. And this price increase was 90 cents from last month. They were at 835 last month. And again, to, to the, the importance of that is with some of these government program payments, PLC and ARC, that uh, at 835, we were actually looking at a small PLC payment for beans. At nine and a quarter, we're 85 cents above the PLC trigger price. So this has really taken us and blown us out of the water that we're not expecting any kind of payments, at least for the 2021 marketing year. So the funds, uh, funds have been adding to their length in beans. And they are, as of last Friday, long 174,000 contracts of soybeans. And they've, or this is as of the middle of last week. They've added probably another 25 to 30,000 since then. So they're almost holding the same long position right now that they did back in 2012, which is kind of fascinating considering that we are still forecasting a record bean yield in the United States right now. So they're really they have really jumped on this demand wagon. Uh, they have been active buyers in soybeans, continue to be active buyers in soybeans. You're seeing a lot of speculative talk around 
not just the ag markets, but you're seeing, if I listen to the business uh, channels during the day, you hear people talking about buying soybeans now. So it seems to be the uh, kind of the darling uh, market of the commodities right now is beans, and it's drawing a lot of speculative interest in, and it's really pushed this market higher, faster, maybe than what it normally would on its own. And look at what November soybeans have done. Uh, it's been a remarkable rally from the low that we had uh, uh, back in, uh, oops, excuse me, uh, from the low we had back in uh, early August. We're up, what, a dollar, almost a dollar and a half right now. Uh, as of this morning, we did top the $10 mark overnight for the first time in this life of this contract. We have traded to new highs uh, again here overnight. Uh, the RSI at the bottom, this green line, the relative strength index at 86 would tell me that this market is extremely overbought. The stochastics lines as well telling us that maybe the volume of trade is slowing down here as we get to this high. But still, uh, this market continues to creep. To, to climb and, and it's hard to put an explanation behind it at this point in time, other than we just still continue to have some money that wants to get into this market. And so you, you, <laughs> you don't necessarily want to get in the way of it, but uh, as a producer, you want to take advantage of it as well. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, this uh, is a screenshot from, uh, well, earlier this morning of my, my screen. Uh, but then on the right-hand side is from the market report letter that I sent last Wednesday. And what do you do about this market right now with where it's at today? Um, right now, the market is telling us not to store a soybean this fall. That's what the futures market is telling us. I think basis levels are kind of telling us the same thing in many areas of the country. They need the beans right now. The Gulf has a lot of beans to ship starting in October to China. And so we need to reward that. And if you look at the carry potential in the market, there is none right now. You got November soybean futures trading virtually $10, January 10.03, even out to May, June. Basically, it's just a flat market, which uh, again, there's no incentive to put beans in a grain bin. Uh, it costs you money to put them in the bin. It costs you money to take them out. Uh, and and you, you have shrink in the bin. So there's really no incentive to do that. If you're still bullish uh, or, you know, some of the opportunities or some things you could do in the market, and I list those on the right-hand side, number one is just sell cash and take the money. If you're satisfied with $10 futures minus whatever the basis is, just sell the beans and take the money. If you're still bullish, then there's probably a couple of things you could do. You could sell cash and buy a call option. Uh, the other thing you could do is just put beans on a basis contract, say versus May or July, because essentially your basis, whatever the basis is versus November right now, if say you're 20 under November, you're gonna be 20 under May and 20 under July. So if you're bullish the futures market, but there's no incentive to store the beans, then at least deliver the beans to the elevator, collect, and you can collect in advance on a basis contract. So these are just some, some things you could do but all of them involve moving the soybeans. I wouldn't want to put beans in a bin uh, unless you just absolutely have to because of either they're too wet to take to town or, or logistics or something like that. But it just doesn't, it's not paying you money to put them in a bin. And so give them to the market. Uh, you can reown them on paper, like we said, either with a, with a call option. Uh, you can buy futures if you wanted to as well. So there's a lot of different things you can do. But some of the questions that I have at the bottom, you know, that still continue to, uh, to abound that will, will China continue to buy beans? They have, but will they continue? At what point will they continue? Will the election have an impact on the markets? Uh, will Brazil really plant the 3% more bean acres this fall as the trade has been talking? And then will U.S. farmers become very aggressive sellers? And then will the funds turn sellers as well? You know, you've got a big, long position from the funds. You've got a big, long position from the U.S. farmer getting ready to come to the market. Uh, I think it, it, it's certainly worth taking advantage of this opportunity that we've been handed. And again, if you want to be bullish, then go buy a call option or something like that. I would prefer to wait until the market went down to buy the call. But if you don't want to miss out, you can jump in and do that right now as well. Uh, for next year, uh, we have been flirting again overnight with the high. We've not really been able to push above the January contract high at 960 yet, uh, but I don't think it's a bad place to start rewarding the market. Again, the RSI is at 74, almost 75. Stochastics lines would tell me this market's getting a little toppy as well. 
So I don't think it's a bad place to reward uh, the, the market. Uh, we'll talk about margin protection insurance in a little bit, but the margin protection price is almost set. This is for the 21 crop year. Uh, we're going to be setting that finally today, and it should be around 9.37 or so. So we've got a good opportunity to utilize that policy as well. If you don't want to forward sell beans today, then using margin protection is one way you can at least lock something in for the 21 marketing year. The corn market, uh, similar to soybeans, we've seen a huge drop uh, in the uh, crop ratings numbers. Go back to the uh, late part of July, we had about 72% of the U.S. crop rated good to excellent, and we've seen that drop about 10 points in the last six weeks. Now here, 62%, and that's certainly been behind the reason that USDA has dropped its yield estimates. And when you look at those numbers from this last report on Friday, uh, you can see the red states did drop, the blue states went up a little bit from last month. Uh, keep in mind, these were uh, for conditions as of September the 1st. The U.S. corn yield would still be a record at 178.5, which is still down 1.8% from last month. Iowa had the biggest drop, but through the central part of the Corn Belt, most of the states did fall back a little bit. Uh, record yields are forecasted still in Kentucky and in Michigan, in Wisconsin and Minnesota and in South Dakota, as well as uh, South Carolina and Georgia and New York. I missed that one. So, you know, we do have some record numbers out here as of September 1. We'll see if those change in subsequent reports. Uh, corn exports to China have been a big deal, and we haven't seen that happen in, what, since the 13-14 year, basically after the drought year of 2012. But we've seen China continue to be a buyer. They bought another 350,000 tons of U.S. corn this morning. Uh, Japan bought some corn this morning as well. So that's uh, been a, a little bit of a black swan, I guess, in corn, that we've finally seen some good demand that has been lacking for quite some time. And that demand coming in the middle of the summer as we move into the fall, it's been very surprising to see. So the balance sheet numbers, uh, USDA did make one tweak to last year's balance sheet. They did lower export numbers as of August 31st, uh, which did raise stocks about 25 million bushels to 2.253 billion, which is pretty close to where we were a year ago and the year before that. So we really haven't seen stocks change a whole lot uh, over the last three years. Average farm price at three dollars and sixty cents, uh, which was about unchanged from the previous year. Again, that number should be the one that gets used to determine PLC and ARC payments. So for PLC, it would be about a dime. For ARC, it depends on how your county yields were this past year. Looking ahead to the new crop balance sheet, we saw a lot of numbers change from USDA. They did lower the harvested acres a half a million. They lowered yield, uh, as we talked about already, and took production down to fourteen point nine billion bushels of corn. Still a huge, huge number. You add that to the beginning stocks and we're looking at over 17 billion bushels of corn supply. Demand, USDA did lower feed and residual 100 million. Uh, they lowered the ethanol 100 million. They raised exports 100 million to 2.325 given the pace that we've been on for new crop sales. Uh, so total demand actually did fall back slightly and ending stocks forecasted to 2.5 billion bushels of corn. Uh, that would be the biggest gross number since 1988, and the stocks to use ratio at 16.9% would be the largest since 2001 in 19 years, actually 20 years since the 20 uh, since the 2001 year. So we're not going to run out of corn unless USDA continues to chop away at this yield number and or the acreage number. You know, we're still looking at a big carryout. We're still looking at 250 million higher than what we were a year ago, and that's with a huge uh, demand forecast right now. And that's with exports forecasted to be back to where we were at a record back in 2017. So, you know, do you get more bullish from here? Uh, I, I don't know that I can get real bullish. I, I, I don't disagree that we could see some downward tweaks in the, in the yield numbers. I don't think it's going to be as dramatic going forward as what we saw in this one. I wouldn't be shocked to see us take another bushel or so out of the yield. But even if we do that, I wouldn't be shocked also to see USDA make some slight cuts in demand. And so do we end up the year 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6? That's probably where the range of stocks numbers are going to be. So just kind of keep that in mind when we're thinking about selling. Uh, average farm price at $3.50. Uh, you know, that's up uh, 40 cents from last month. We were 3.10. So that changes the dynamic tremendously. 
uh, in regards to the PLC program. And I'll talk about that here after a bit. But the funds have really reversed their positions. Been a huge reversal in the last uh, really three weeks. We've gone from short over 160,000 contracts of corn to as of the middle of last week, now we're long almost 35,000 contracts of corn. And you wonder why the markets have done what they've done. Well, look, they did, look where they started back in June. And one of the things that I mentioned a couple of different times this summer was, you know, if there's any reason to be bullish, it's the fact that the, the funds are so short. And that's a time when you definitely do not want to be a seller. You don't want to be a seller when the funds are holding record short positions. Now that they've moved to the long side of the market, now's when we look to try to reward the market. And historically at this time of the year, they don't tend to buy much corn. And in fact, they tend to trade on the short side of the market more often than not. So this is kind of an aberration that they're actually on the long side of the market here as we go into harvest. So, but you can see the impact of their buying run uh, really from the beginning of August. It's, you know, they've given us a 50 cent rally in December corn futures. We uh, overnight made a new high at 371, did back off a little bit here this morning since the, the uh, open of the day session. But we are trading above the 200 day moving average, this light blue line. The nine day moving average continues to be our support as, we, as the market goes up. But again, kind of like soybeans, the RSI at 70. And stochastics would both tell us that this market's probably getting a little bit overdone for the moment. And so if you're utilizing these indicators at the bottom of the page, uh, you know, to help you make, decide when's a good time to be making sales, now would be a good time to do it. Whether you reown it with a call, whatever the case is, you know, now's not a bad time to be locking in some price. And just wanted to kind of review the, the, what the ladder looks like in corn futures as well. Uh, but uh, it's changed a lot in the last month. We've seen the spreads narrow. A month ago, we were looking at December to December at 30 cents a bushel. Now that's into about 20 cents. So the nearby contract has risen relative to the deferred months, which does a couple of things. It tells us that the market needs more corn nearby than what had had a month ago. Uh, but it also dilutes the opportunity to store and make money. Uh, still, it's it's the best uh, storage crop there is. Uh, we can't make any money storing soybeans right now in the futures market spreads. Uh, wheat is not showing near the carry that we're seeing in the corn market as well right now. So it, it's still telling us it's, uh, to store corn. And if the carryover is really going to be two and a half billion bushels, I would tend to think these spreads at some point will widen back out a little bit. And what that would really typically mean is that the nearby months would drop relative to the deferreds. So again, I think this helps me to maybe be wanting to make, a, uh, make some sales. I think most elevators right now, if they're selling or hedging corn, they're selling it in the nearby December, figuring that that month is going to drop back a little bit here as we get into the harvest period. So we'll see. But uh, if you like to lock in the carries, uh, I don't know that I would want to do it today. But uh, a month ago, we talked about selling out into the July contract or even selling out into the December contract and then potentially holding grain on out into next year. So maybe that's not as attractive today, but it still is better than any other uh, commodity that we're seeing right now. So looking ahead to next year, what do we got? Well, we traded over 390 this morning on December 21 corn. Who wants to sell $4 corn? Uh, I sure do. And so I think now is the time we ought to be having some offers in the market. Uh, even if you don't want to sell today, uh, you know, be, be putting some offers in. Maybe it's $4, maybe it's $3.99, $3.98, whatever the number is. I think that'd be a great place to get started selling some next year crop. Uh, keep in mind, we had 10 million prevented plant acres this year. I don't think I would bet on that happening again next year. So if that number comes down to five or below, then I think that, uh, you know, we're likely going to gain some corn acreage next year. And so I, I don't think he, uh, hedging corn at $4 or, so, or around that area is a bad, bad move to be making. The other thing you could consider doing, if you don't like selling corn at, uh, right now, maybe you consider the margin protection insurance policy. And I'll talk about that here after a bit. But margin protection base price will be final today, and it's likely going to be around 382 uh, if the market stays where it's at today. So 382 gives you a floor basically there with a 95% policy. And the way I would look at that right now from a price perspective is if the price were to drop 5% and all the other numbers, if the yield and the input costs remain unchanged, 
anything below 362 then would start to trigger a payment for me. So this is one way essentially I can buy a put option utilizing that crop insurance policy, still have bushel protection from the policy as well, and still have some input price protection from margin protection policies as well. So there's some things I can do with that, that insurance program. If I'm not willing to go out and forward sell corn, maybe I look at utilizing that program. Uh, the cotton market. Cotton saw some uh, changes as well in its report this month. Uh, USDA's crop condition numbers continue to struggle versus the last, uh, uh, some of the f recent years, I guess. The last two have been down, but uh, besides that, we've been, uh, you know, we're below the previous three years in crop ratings, only running about 45% good to excellent. Uh, we've had uh, the Texas crop been under some pressure because of heat, and dry weather. Uh, and now we've had some of the Mid-South and Delta crops under pressure because of the uh, uh, consistent hurricane damage that we've had uh, with at least two. And now we've got another one staring at us here this week. But as far as the yields go uh, from the re this last report, uh, the blue states got bigger, the red states got smaller. Uh, the big one is in Texas. The yield went down 4.8%. Georgia was down 7.1%. Missouri dropped as well. Uh, still forecasting a record uh, cotton yield in, in Arkansas, which is a little bit of a surprise. But uh, kind of all over the map. But yield at 910 pounds would be down 3 pounds or 3% from last month. So when we look at the uh, balance sheet numbers, USDA continues to make a lot of tweaks, uh, made some tweaks in the demand side. They did bump old crop export numbers slightly, did lower the domestic usage, made a slight increase net into the ending stocks estimate. Uh, 59 and a half cents was the final price for cotton as of this report. Looking ahead, uh, USDA made another drop in acres, both uh, planted and harvested acres, made another drop in the yield from last month. Uh, from 932, I believe, down to 910. And that took production down just over 1 million bales. Huge drop there percentage-wise. However, they made a big cut out of the, the demand side of things as well. Took uh, domestic use down, took export numbers down, and ending stocks only fell 400,000 bales from 7.6 to 7.2 million bales. So that was a bit disappointing to the bulls because I think most of us that, you know, if you were bullish based on supply or based on production and the fact that we took a million bales out of production, yet stocks still remained above 7 million bales. So that's, again, it was disappointing, I think, for the market. Uh, now we'll see if the hurricane this week has any impact, but uh, the market average price, USDA did not change, left it alone at 59 cents uh, per pound. Looking at the chart, though, it's been a heck of a run in cotton. And, uh, you know, we'll see if we can sustain it as we get into harvest. But uh, we've made our early low in April. And since then, it's been, uh, you know, kind of sky's the limit. We've got, come back to 66 cents from 50 cent low. Uh, the base price for our revenue insurance was 70 cents last year. So we're back up into kind of no man's land as far as getting a payment unless you have a yield loss. Um, RSI at 54, stochastics both would indicate a fairly flat market as of right now. Same for D's 21, uh, sitting around 65 cent cotton price. I, I think 70 cents is still a target that I would have in mind, or if you get up around 69 to 70, I still like the idea of these uh, uh, three-way type option trades or, or put call option trades, buy a put, sell a call, uh, or buy a put, sell a put, sell a call, something like that. But uh, anything I could do to lock in a floor up around 70 cents, even if I'm willing to take a ceiling a few cents higher, I, I think that would be a nice trade. So I don't think we're there today. Uh, again, the indicators at 55 and the stochastics both would indicate a fairly uh, flat neutral market right now. But uh, if I get up around 69, 70 cents, I think I want to be doing something to manage price risk here. But you notice the gray line I drew in, this, this uptrend line continues to really kind of, you know, kind of dictate where this market's trading. And as long as these short-term moving averages, the nine and the 20 day continue to trend higher, I think we're okay. But if you see those start to dip, then I think I'd wanna uh, at least take uh, take notice and maybe do something on the market. The wheat, uh, wheat did uh, was nothing uh, on Friday's report. Did not see any changes to any of the balance sheet numbers. USDA kept all their old crop numbers the same, kept all of their new crop numbers the same, kept the average farm price the same at $4.50. So the positive here, the US number balance sheet looks a lot better. 
than what it has. We've got ending stocks below a billion bushels for the first time in, I think, four or five years. And that ought to help to support this market as we move forward. The negative in this whole thing right now for wheat is the, the, the world balance sheet. And I know I got a lot of numbers on the screen, but just take a look at this right-hand column for 2021. And the green numbers in particular were numbers that USDA increased in this report. They increased world production, would be a record, 770 million metric tons. Increased the EU production to 136, increased Canadian production, increased Australian production to, uh, the, well, that's the largest that number's been since back in 2012. Total supply of wheat would be a record high this year. And even with decent demand, we're looking at record ending stocks of wheat at the world level, 319 uh, million metric tons, and a stocks to use ratio at a record over 34 per, or at 34%. So that's kind of a bummer for this, those of us in the U.S. that, you know, we've done our part to, to reduce wheat uh, production, and, uh, but we haven't been rewarded because the rest of the world is, uh, is uh, raising a lot of wheat. And so that's, uh, again, kind of the bummer that we've got. And here it is in a picture. Here's what the world stocks to, uh, ending stocks to use ratio looks like at the world level. So we continue to, to, again, just swim in a lot of wheat at the world level. And the U.S. is having trouble, especially on, uh, you know, on lower quality wheat competing at the world level. Our competition's got to be on the good quality wheat. Maybe we can sneak in and get some sales off. But uh, you look at Minneapolis spring wheat, here's the December contract. Uh, we have bounced off or back down from the recent, uh, recent high. We had a nice 50 cent rally or 45 cent rally from the beginning of August. The market kind of trended with the corn and uh, trended with some of the weather issues that maybe we were seeing at least at the time in, in North Dakota and upper Minnesota. Uh, but this market was unable to get through the 200-day moving average, and now we've slipped back down uh, to the point where the, the indicators are basically flat. Uh, we are sitting right at the 100 and the 20-day moving average lines at 532. Uh, this 50-day uh, moving average, the gold line at 527 is pretty important, I think, here uh, in the short term. If we're able to hold that uh, and solidify this market, maybe we got another run back up. Uh, but uh, we've, we've been under some harvest pressure, I think, over the last two weeks and kind of taking the top off this market. So that 200-day moving average to the upside is still going to be some pretty hefty resistance on the top side. Looking ahead to next year, uh, in case you're thinking ahead, uh, we've done the same thing on the chart. It looks a lot more dramatic because we don't have very many months of trading in. But uh, we have slipped back, but we've got support right now at the 100 and the 50-day moving average. Those are going to be pretty important around 564, 565. If we're able to hold those, maybe we got another run to the upside. Uh, I guess I would have some offers working maybe up around the 590 level, something sub $6. Uh, that would be a good place to get started on some new crop sales. And that would be the highest that we've traded in this contract. So we'll see if that can happen. But I think I'd put some offers in, at least have something working. Uh, at, at the elevator. Looking at uh, Chicago wheat, uh, here's a picture of the fund position in Chicago wheat futures, and they continue to be on the long side of the wheat market up there. And that's, uh, you know, we don't see a whole lot of that over the last six years. Uh, and I mentioned that this spring as well, that we haven't had a lot of periods where we've had Chicago wheat where the funds were wanting to be long. And But uh, but you look at the, just the U.S. balance sheet, you know, there's, there's more reasons for optimism than when you look at the world balance sheet. So what's going on in Chicago wheat? Well, it's been an awful erratic trade over the last uh, six, seven, eight, nine months. Uh, we continue to make ceilings, though, up around that 570 to 580 level, and we run out of gas there each time. And you look at the number of times, look at the relative strength index at the bottom of the page. We had the RSI at the beginning of the year up over 70, happened again here in July, happened again here at the beginning of September each time these markets made their highs. So uh, that's one indicator that you, you probably ought to be using. Uh, the stochastics as well, we, we've seen a very, uh, if you, if you, very textbook-like uh, run in the stochastics over the last nine months. That, you know, when the red line crosses the blue line after, the, you know, we're at a bottom, the market rallies. And when we get to the top, red line crosses the blue line, that means the market's over market goes back down again. So it's been very methodical trade in Chicago wheat. And right now we seem to be kind of on the downside at least uh, for the moment. So we'll watch these long-term averages. The, the light blue line at 545 is the 200 day. 
that's probably as important as any right now, but then you've got the 50 and the 100 just below that uh, providing some support as well. Uh, similar looking chart for Kansas City wheat, uh, although not quite as many peaks, but uh, KC wheat still uh, kind of backed off of its high. We're at 57 on the RSI and the stochastics would indicate a neutral market. Um, still looking at the 100 day at 488 as support, so about a dime below where the market's currently at. And uh, as far as top side goes, it looks to me like the 510 area, probably not a bad place to be selling some KC uh, next July wheat as a place to get started. So that's kind of the update on the markets. Uh, you know, for the most part, we've, we, we see corn and beans probably overbought right now. Uh, cotton and wheat probably somewhat neutral. So I, I think I want to be doing something in these, uh, in the corn and the bean markets right now. And whether it's a minimum price or whatever it is, I, I think it, it's beneficial to us to take advantage of this rally and be doing something on the marketing side. For crop insurance, we are almost halfway through the month of setting harvest prices uh, in some of our southern states, uh, Texas, uh, as well as Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, you can see what those crops uh, averages are running right now relative to the base prices down at the bottom. Uh, you've got still about a 7%, 8% drop in corn, uh, sorghum 8 to 9%, cotton down about 9%. Now, what this means is, is that if you got an 80% policy, for example, there's not enough drop in the price alone in order to trigger a payment. So you would have to have some additional loss in bushels in order to have a revenue loss in order to at least 20% in order to, to cover your deductible there. Um, for rice and soybeans, we're actually now trading above what the base prices were for those crops. So again, we would have to have a, a loss in production uh, on the production side in order to see a revenue loss, it, assuming these prices hold. Uh, the other states will start setting their prices in October, on October 1st. So we'll see what the markets do. But uh, if the markets continue to stay high, that would probably not trigger many losses on the revenue side. The other thing we're tracking right now is next year for, uh, well, I've got over on the right-hand side of this column, uh, Mississippi and Arkansas corn. We're one day away from finishing setting the harvest price for it as well, about 10.5% down. But then the other things I've got on this at the same period from the middle of August to the middle of September are the uh, wheat prices for next year for the 21. Today will be the final day for setting those. And I'm looking at these as fairly attractive relative to what we've seen the last couple of years. So far, we've got a July Chicago wheat average at 555. That's up about 70 cents from where it had been last year. Uh, for the northern states on September wheat, we're looking at about a, a 64 or 66 cent bump from a year ago. KC wheat up 65 cents in the July and up 50 cents in the September. So all of our revenue uh, products for next year's wheat are going to be in better shape uh, than what they were this past year. So again, that's a positive, I think, to consider. If you're going to plant wheat this fall, certainly take a look at the revenue policies and, uh, and see what kind of a guarantee you can get uh, because of the higher price this year. The other product I've talked about a few times is margin protection insurance. Uh, we are almost done setting the averages for 2021 for corn, soybeans, and wheat, as well as, as, well as these input costs for urea, DAP, diesel, and uh, interest rates. And uh, you can see down here relative to last year, corn averaging 381. Last year was at 403. Uh, this average may jump to 382 this afternoon if the price stays where it's at right now. Soybeans uh, probably going to raise another penny or two to this afternoon and going to be six, seven cents above last year. Uh, spring wheat running above last year by about 15 cents. So uh, so some better opportunities to utilize margin uh, protection on soybeans and wheat than last year. Not quite as good as corn. But one thing I would also point out is that our input costs as a whole are running below last year. Excuse me. Uh, the uh, urea running uh, about 30 bucks a ton below last year. DAP is higher, but potash is down, diesel's down sharply, and interest rates are running about a point below last year. So that's going to help our margin, essentially. We're going to have lower overall input costs. That's going to help our margin increase versus a year ago and what we can lock in with that product. So before I get into 21, just a quick glance back at last year, because this is something I've talked about throughout the growing season this year. And when prices were way down 
what this policy was really going to be doing for us. And just a month ago, even when we were at 320 corn, we were looking at some significant payments and margin protection this year, not because of loss in bushels or input costs, but because of the drop in the price. The fact that we had started at 403 last fall and had traded down into the 320s, we were looking at a 20% loss in price. And these policies are at 95%. So even with decent yields, we were looking at some significant losses. And I ran a couple of these again just uh, over the weekend just to kind of show you what the policy would be looking at right now. But this one's for Macon County, Illinois, where I think the crop's going to be pretty good this year. Uh, and I think maybe slightly above average. And so the expected county yield in Macon County was a 214.1. If I suggest that the final yield might be 218, a little bit above average. And with the price today at 369 and interest where it's at, we would be getting a small indemnity payment here for margin protection insurance. Now, keep in mind, these final prices don't get set till October. So if the market goes down starting in October, we would be looking at the indemnity increasing throughout the month. What if I were in Marshall County, Iowa? Um, <laughs> one of the areas that's probably been impacted greatly by the uh, uh, derecho. And let's say that that county yield ends up at 165, which would be down 41 bushels from the expected county yield. If the price stays at 369, Marshall County would be looking at a $200 indemnity payment this year. So you can see the impact of this policy because it's got a 95% trigger that it doesn't take a whole lot to make a 5% loss, either bushels, price, some combination of the two, and you're looking at a substantial payment. And we have a multiplier in this policy of 1.2. So when there's a dollar lost, essentially in margin, you get paid a dollar and 20 cents. So any of these loss situations, they add up pretty quickly. And so if the price goes down here and these bushels don't change, you know, these indemnity payments in Iowa and some of these central Iowa counties could be very, very large here this year. So something to keep track of if you're thinking about the policy for 2021, uh, take a look at the 2020 policy and see how it's performing as we go forward. Looking ahead to next year, uh, the average we think is going to be 382 for margin protection. So we are running about eight cents above that in the market right now. But uh, again, I mentioned this earlier, but if I assume going into the year that my yield, we're going to have an average crop, and I assume that input costs don't change a whole lot, then it only takes a 5% drop in price to start to trigger a payment, which would be 362. And we've traded below that on this contract numerous times over the last few months. So I, I would not rule that out next year, especially if we increase acres and we start next marketing year with a two and a half billion bushel carryover. And so there's reasons to, you know, to think that prices could have some downside risk. So if I'm not willing to jump out and sell corn today for next year, then the alternative might be to utilize this policy. So I ran this example, Hendricks County, Indiana, where we've got an expected county yield at 189.7. Let's assume that the county yield comes in a year down the road at average. Let's assume the input costs all stay the same and the price goes to 340. Then if that happens, we'd be looking at a $50 indemnity check. So this is the way I look at this policy. It's a put option on price, at least for now. Once we get into the growing season, that may change as the yields of the counties change. But today I'm looking at it for 21 as a way I can protect price without having to go to the market and sell corn or buy options in the marketplace. And it's a subsidized put from the government. So the government's picking up, I think, 44% of this policy. So not only am I getting downside price protection, I'm also getting bushel protection based on the county. And I do have the upside protection in case we have another 2012 and the market goes up in the fall. Um, I also ran another example for Jackson County, Minnesota. And to say, what if, what do, has to happen in price to break even essentially, or where does it start? And I showed you this on the chart a second ago, but if the county has an average yield in this example, 191.4, then a price drop to 361 would start to trigger a payment. So it only takes a 20 cent drop in price from where the base price is, assuming everything else stays the same to start to trigger a payment. So again, if a producer is not gonna forward sell today at, at 390 or whatever, but I want something to at least give us some protection, this is what I could do with my policy. And keep in mind, I can add individual coverage with this as well later on in, in February and March. So if the, you know, if the RP 
price in, in the spring is decent and I want to add maybe an 80, 85% policy, even a 75%, I'm going to get a credit for doing that that's going to go back against the cost of my margin protection. And in many cases, it's going to be enough to cover most of, if not all the cost of your, of your RP policy. So there's a lot of ways I can combine these policies together uh, without much additional cost, if any, in some cases uh, in the spring. So talk to your agent about this policy you've got till the end of this month. If you're interested in learning more about how margin protection works, uh, I've recorded a webinar here about two weeks ago. It's out on our YouTube page. Uh, talks all about margin protection, gives you all my thoughts on it. So go check that out if you wanna learn more about the details of this policy. And soybeans, uh, don't forget about the beans. Uh, beans were pretty cheap this year for margin. I think it was around 15 bucks an acre uh, in some places. So it's at least something you could consider. And with the price up here pushing 940 on an average, uh, who knows what happens if Brazil grows record beans? What happens if the US and China decide not to get along anymore? What happens if we grow a big bean crop next year? So, you know, what if? And if you're not going to go to the market and sell it, then this is something you can do to basically put a put option price protection under the market. And I guess I did run an example here. This is Wayne County, Iowa. Uh, would have to have, if we had an average yield with average input costs, price would have to go to 890 to start to trigger an indemnity payment. So essentially I'm looking at this as an 890 put option um, and the government's picking up 44% of the cost of the policy. Another crop insurance product I wanna mention here real quick is R Powered. And we, you know, talking about this rally we've had in the corn and the bean markets. If you're not gonna do margin protection, let's say you're just buying revenue policies in February and March, what can I do to lock in price today? Uh, you can use the R Powered program to do that. R Powered is, is a product that allows you to do some different things. But the, really the two things you can do right now are A, you could, you could essentially set the price as of yesterday. If I liked yesterday's price at 950, for example, I can lock that in as a minimum for my February average for my crop insurance. If the February average doesn't come up to 950, I get to use 950. If it does, if it exceeds 950, then I get to use the February average. So I can lock in a particular price on a given day, uh, or I can use it to be able to lock in months. So I can say, I wanna use the month of October to average or November, December, or all the way out to June, July next year. Uh, or I can do bi-week or two-week periods as well. So there's a lot of different things I can do with this R, Pro R powered product. But I'm just thinking right now with this rally we've had in nearby beans at 10 bucks with new crop at 950 for next year, if I like that price, if I don't want it to get away from me, I can use the R powered to be able to lock that in. So visit with your NAU agent to get, learn more about this product if you're interested. The farm program, these are the latest farm program prices in the, uh, the gold, uh, gold uh, rectangles. Uh, the ones on the left were the, should be the final numbers for the 1920 marketing year. Uh, you'll notice that all of them are highlighted in gold except for soybeans, and that's because beans are not low enough to trigger a PLC payment. All the other crops right now would be low enough to be able to trigger PLC payments for the 2019 marketing year. Those payments will be made this fall, probably sometime in late October or November, like they were a year ago. For next year, the marketing year just started, September 1st. These are USDA's current estimates. 350 corn, that went up 40 cents from last month. Beans went up 90 cents. Uh, and you can see what all the other numbers are looking at as well. Uh, we haven't got updates yet on seed, cotton, and peanuts, but those should be coming out here in the next couple of days. So the gold ones still would be looking at paying PLC payments for the 2021 marketing year, but we're, we've got 11 and a half months to go before those pr uh, prices will be final. But I wanted to update you and go back through some of the calculations again. So looking at the 19 crop for PLC wheat, essentially that number's been set at 458. We would be looking at a 92% PLC payment. Multiply that by your payment yield on your farm times 85% of the wheat base acres. In this example, I'd be getting $31 an acre. Keep in mind, when you do elect PLC, you are able to add the supplemental coverage option with your insurance policy. That's a county, county level coverage, starts at 86%, goes down to your individual level of coverage. 
but you can only add SCO if you enroll in the PLC program. Corn, we'd be looking at a dime, not a whole lot. You get a dime times your payment yield times 85%, looking at 12 to 13 bucks an acre in this example. Sorghum, we would be looking at about 70 cents a bushel. Um, I'm not sure if I updated that. Let me look. Uh, sorghum was at 3.30. I'm sorry, I did not. So we would only be getting 65 cents now times uh, my payment yield times 85% of my base acres, still be looking at about $40 an acre. For ARC, uh, ARC depends on the county yields. Uh, I have, I, I, it's, there's way too many counties in the country to go through them all, but in order to trigger an ARC payment for last year, assuming that this 360 price holds, we would have to have a, price, uh, a yield drop in the county in this example of about 17 and a half bushels. So the price drop of a dime from the benchmark price did help, but we're gonna have to have also a yield loss in the county to trigger an ARC payment. Now this is what uh, Farm Doc had put out a couple of months back. The dark green counties were looking at significant ARC payments for 2019, the blue counties looking at nothing. And so you can kind of tell on the map which counties might be subject to an ARC payment for the 2019 year. And again, those payments will be made automatically here in late October or early November. Uh, soybeans, one of the things that made beans attractive for ARC to sign up last year was that we were looking at a significant drop in the uh, from the benchmark price. The benchmark price was set high, and the fact that we're down over a dollar a bushel means that you would not have had to have much of a county yield loss to trigger an ARC payment on beans. You can see the green counties, we've got a lot more counties triggering some payment on ARC for beans uh, for, the, for last year. And again, we'll get those final numbers here shortly. For 2020, for wheat PLC, as of today, right now USDA forecasting that price at $4.50, meaning we would get a buck a bushel times my payment yield times 85% of my wheat base acres, we'd be looking at about $34 an acre. Now keep in mind this is on base acres, it's not on what you planted. Some of you may have a wheat base, haven't planted wheat in 10 years. You'd still be eligible to get that PLC payment on wheat. Same with corn. Corn, USDA did raise this number up, but still looking at a 350 price or 20 cents a bushel. That would equate to, in this example, about $25 an acre in a PLC payment. Sorghum, we'd be looking at about 45 cents a bushel uh, as of today, times my payment yield, times my base acres. Uh, that would uh, roughly $30 an acre in this example. So we've got, again, 10, uh, 11 and a half months to go before they're final, but starting out, we're looking at some payment on these crops. Cotton seed, as of today, would be looking at over seven cents or maybe possibly over $100 an acre in, in cotton seed payments. Soybeans, as of right now, not getting a payment. A month ago, USDA was forecasting the market year average price at 835, which would have given us a nickel. Now we're 85 cents above the reference price. So we would not expect to be seeing any payments for beans for the next year. One other thing to mention on the programs, uh, we are currently facing an update. If you want to update your payment yields for PLC, you can still do that through September 30th. And essentially what USDA is going to be doing for corn and soybeans is you'll be taking, uh, the, the short math is take 81% times your uh, running five-year Olympic average. And if that's higher than what you currently have at the FSA office, they will go ahead and update your payment yield. If it's not higher, you get to stay with your current payment yield. Uh, some of the other crops have slightly different ratios, uh, percentages, uh, but for corn and beans, it works out to 90% times another 90%, which is this other ratio, uh, which means 81% but you do have a deadline of September 30th to do this. So if you've had very strong numbers over the last five years and you think 81% of that five-year Olympic average is gonna be higher than what your, uh, or, or not Olympic average, just simple average, if 81% of that's higher than what you got at FSA, it's gonna increase that PLC yield, which means you'll increase your PLC payments as you go forward. So something to at least take advantage of if you have the opportunity. In closing, got some things coming up. We got our deadline at the end of this month for winter wheat. We've got our deadline for margin protection for corn, soybeans, and spring wheat. Uh, we also have the deadline I just mentioned for updating PLC payment yields at the FSA office. So a lot of stuff has to be done by the end of this month. Um, October 9th will be our next USDA crop report. That is on a Friday once again. We will have the aftermath webinar the following Monday morning. So we'll get the weekend to digest the report and talk about it uh, in the aftermath. Uh, 
We've got those payments for PLC and ARC to be made here uh, in late October or early November. Uh, we've also heard a little bit about potential uh, that other 20% of your, uh, I believe, CFAT payments that are expected to be made as well sometime this fall. Uh, so we might be able to get some money coming from the government there as well. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up yet, you can sign up to get our marketing uh, information via the opening bell daily phone call, the market report every afternoon, this aftermath webinar that we do once a month, my Kick It Up Dust podcast that I record every couple of weeks. I did record one on Friday. If you go to Podbean, you can uh, subscribe and get notifications when those are updated, or you can uh, tune, uh, go to our uh, agent portal or our farmer portal uh, on the NAU Country website. You can listen to all of those. Uh, Crop Scout Insights, uh, we haven't done one in a couple of weeks. We're going to plan on doing another one here in early October, kind of a harvest wrap-up. And so that's a, a letter that we do bi-weekly uh, with an update on crops around the country. And so we've got a lot of other sources of market information as well on our website. Make sure you check it out. Also want to give an update on Field Insights. Uh, if you have not utilized this service from any U country, I would highly encourage you to do so. It's a tremendous uh, uh, service to have crop information, to have weather information at your fingertips. It's available through our app on your iPhone or, or Android phone. It's available on the website as well. Uh, it's not only, it doesn't only have just weather information, but you can pinpoint, it's got your farms on here. So you can look down at your farms, you can look and see field conditions in your farms, you can look at wind conditions on your farms. We've got this spray window advisor, a lot of different information. We get hail alerts. So it's a great, great tool. Uh, it doesn't cost you a darn thing. So I would encourage everybody on here to sign up. I put my dad's farms in here and look and see what's going on on his farms uh, from time to time what's going on with, uh, you know, how much rain he's got, whether he can work today or not. Uh, he lives 10 miles away from a couple of farms, so it's kind of nice to be able to see what the field conditions are without having to drive over. So I would encourage you to check this out if you haven't. So with that, I appreciate everybody joining in. If you've got questions or comments afterwards, please shoot me an email or a text. Uh, my email address is rich.morrison at naucountry.com. So please shoot me an email if you've got any questions, anything you want to discuss. And with that, I appreciate you joining in and thanks for taking the time and we'll look forward to visiting with you again next month.